By 1800, the beginning of the 19th century, a lot had been learned about matter and how compounds can be broken down into their elements. And also, a lot was learned about the nature of elements and how they combine to form compounds. Nevertheless, there was still a lot of confusion and disagreement about the nature of elements and how they combine. And this confusion wasn't really cleared up until the mid-century. And the confusion only cleared up after the acceptance of two new theories that were proposed early in the century but not accepted until the middle of the century. And the first of those theories was proposed by a school teacher from England named John Dalton. Although he loved to teach, Dalton's real interest was in meteorology. He loved to study weather and the atmosphere, and he used chemical methods to separate gases from the atmosphere to analyze them. And in 1808, he wrote a chemistry textbook which included a new model for what comprised substances. His new model was called the Atomic Theory of Matter. In it, he proposed that gases and liquids and solids, all substances, were made up of tiny, unimaginably small particles he called atoms. And he claimed that the atoms of a given element were identical in all ways. His new model contained four basic points. First, that all matter is made of atoms which are indivisible and indestructible. Second, he said that all atoms of a given element are identical in mass and properties. Third, he said that compounds are formed by a combination of two or more different atoms. For example, carbon and oxygen make carbon dioxide. Hydrogen and oxygen make water. And lastly, he said a chemical reaction is a rearrangement of atoms. This was a very big deal because now it was totally understood that when substances change the way they look, elements that make them up are really not being destroyed and nothing's being created, but atoms are just being rearranged and combined in different ways to form things that look, taste, and feel different. Here's a diagram that shows the symbols that Dalton used in his book to identify 20 elements. Taking a closer look at the first 10 elements, you can see that Dalton has placed numbers next to each one, and these numbers were relative atomic masses. That means masses that relate to hydrogen. He gave hydrogen a mass of one because up to that time, and even today, we know that hydrogen is the lightest element known. And azo, which is the old-fashioned word for nitrogen, he assigned the number five because by his experiments, he assumed that nitrogen was five times heavier than hydrogen and carbon was six times heavier, and so on. However, none of these relative atomic masses were accurate. In this chart, also published in Dalton's book, we can see that the top one quarter includes symbols for the known 20 elements, and the bottom three quarters include what Dalton thought were combinations of atoms, today we call molecules. And if we look closely, we can see that Dalton made mistakes in his assumptions about the number of elements that combine to form certain molecules. The molecule making up the compound water shown in red here is wrong. You can see that he guessed that water was made up of one hydrogen and one oxygen. And we now know that water is comprised of two hydrogens and one oxygen. And this mistake was made by Dalton even knowing about an experiment that was done several years before his book was published that when electricity is put into water, it separates into gas with a ratio of two hydrogen volumes to one oxygen volume. Dalton did not understand the significance of this experiment, and it wasn't until this man named Amadeo Avogadro came up with the second big idea, that equal volumes of gases at equal temperatures and pressures contain the same number of particles. That means that if you have two equal volumes of gas, say oxygen in one container and hydrogen in another, if the containers are at the same temperature and pressure, they will contain the same number of atoms of oxygen as hydrogen. Shown up here on the right in the yellow, we can see the mathematical expression for Avogadro's law. What it basically states is that the number of particles, which we call n here, is directly proportional to the volume that they take up if the particles are a gas. And most importantly, it doesn't matter what the gas is. 
whether it's an elemental gas such as oxygen or hydrogen, or a compound gas made up of molecules such as carbon dioxide, which we'll talk more about later. What we see here is a pictorial view or a diagrammatic view of Avogadro's principle. At the same temperature and pressure, each one of these containers holds the same number of particles because the volumes are the same. And that's even given the fact that the particles are different. From left to right, we have nitrogen, hydrogen, and oxygen in the containers. Yet, since they take up the same volume, each container holds the same number of particles. Now, chemists were able to accurately determine relative atomic masses by just comparing equal volumes of different gases. And by doing this, chemists were able to much more accurately determine how much heavier all of the known elements were compared to hydrogen. Here we see azote, which is nitrogen, is actually 14 times heavier than hydrogen instead of 5, as Dalton said. And carbon is 12 times heavier, oxygen 16 times heavier, and so on. With these new atomic masses relative to hydrogen, chemists were able to accurately determine chemical formulas in a way they never could before. By using Avogadro's principle, it was determined that hydrogen and chlorine only bond once. So the formula for hydrogen chloride could be determined to be HCl. We know this because when we react one gram of hydrogen with chlorine, the resulting hydrogen chloride weighs just about 36 grams. This is because chlorine is 35 times heavier than hydrogen. That was figured out using Avogadro's law. So we know that hydrogen chloride is one to one. Also with the help of Avogadro's new idea, it was determined that lithium, sodium, and potassium also bond only once. So the formula for the chlorides of each of these metals is lithium chloride, sodium chloride, and potassium chloride. Furthermore, it was determined that magnesium and calcium are very different from lithium, sodium, and potassium because they bond to chlorine twice. And in the math lesson associated with this video, we will show you knowing the relative atomic masses of the elements and using some simple ratios and proportions how these formulas were calculated. And in the next video, we will show you how this man, Dmitry Mendeleev, using the information known about the elements that existed in 1865, discovered some interesting patterns which led him to create the very first periodic table of the elements.